One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good afternoon, everybody. Happy Sunday, and welcome to the NTEB House Church Sunday service. My name is Pastor Jeff Greider, and I'd like to welcome you to our worship service today. My message, Staying by the Stuff is the Secret to Serving God, uh, is a message I've been working on for a long time. You might say that I've been working on this message for about the last 13 years. And I'm going to explain that to you um, when it comes time for the preaching. King David was an amazing man of God, and not just for the amazing things that he did. Sometimes it was, it was for what he didn't do. One main thing that King David didn't do was he never quit. Even after his disastrous business with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, David stayed in the game. There is a scene in 1 Samuel that reveals an amazing secret of serving God successfully. You have to stay by the stuff. 1 Samuel 30, verse 24. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. Israel is battling with the Amalekites, and the war is not going so well. It goes so bad, in fact, that two of David's wives were captured and taken away. Now, King David has 600 men to help him to turn the tide of the battle, but 200 of them, one-third of his men, were so tired and so worn out that they didn't have the strength to fight. So what they were tasked with doing was to stay by the stuff belonging to the men who could fight. That way, while they were gone, they didn't lose their stuff when they got back. When the battle was over, King David came and saluted the men who stayed by the stuff, sparking some angry rebuttals by the wicked men to not allow them to partake in the spoils of their victory because they didn't go to battle with the rest of the men. But the king rebuked them, and in doing so, that shows us a superstar secret to successfully serving God, staying by the stuff. As we celebrate the start of our 14th year in ministry, that's today, I'd like to bring you a message on the importance of staying by the stuff if you want to serve God, because it's the only way to do it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here today. We thank you, God, for over two years of these Sunday services and over two years of the podcasts and over 10 years of our weekly Bible studies. And today, Father God, is day number one on year 14 of the ministry of Now the End Begins. And uh, Father God, I can scarcely believe it. I can hardly believe. Uh, I hardly could have imagined 13 years ago, Lord, that not only would I still be on the battlefield, but that the ministry would have grown to what you have expanded it to. So today, Father God, um, 
we are going to do our very best to be thankful to you today, God, as a church family. And uh, Lord, this is day number one of the 14th year of Now the End Begins, and we're glad and we're grateful and we're thankful. We're thankful for our NTEB family um, that's across America and around the world. And uh, Lord, you are so much better to us than we deserve. And uh, Lord, we're just going to take a few moments today and we're going to thank you. We're going to praise you for what you've done with this ministry. And Lord, uh, we have a list a mile long of all the praise reports of people who have gotten saved and saved people who have gotten on fire for you and people who have um, had incredible healings and turnarounds and you've given them favor and you've restored relationships and you fixed the things that were broken and you've reconciled on so many levels, God. And every single person here can Um, stand up and give a testimony of your goodness that they've experienced through this ministry. And uh, Lord, I just, uh, I'm humbled today, very humbled, Lord, that uh, you would allow us to stay on the battlefield for so long, for so very long. And Lord, we just pray in these last days, as we see the tide of evil Uh, ever rising and threatening to snuff out every light, Lord. We know that you are the light of the world and you cannot be extinguished, Lord. Uh, You say that a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid and no man um, lighteth a light to put it under a bushel. And uh, the Bible says that, that we are the light of the world because we reflect or we're supposed to reflect your glory, Father God. You are the sun and we are the moon. And uh, we just, we're just glad today, Lord, we're grateful. And uh, Father God, we, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, today is the first day of year number 14 of the ministry of Now the End Begins. We started out as a tiny little one-page blog And God has expanded us. We are just a couple of dozen articles away from 10,000 published articles. And um, it is amazing to me. It is amazing to me. We we are just under 100,000 free Bibles and uh, 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 scripture portions and New Testaments that we've given out. And God is doing so many amazing things with this ministry. Um that we really just need to thank him uh, that he would raise this thing up and that he would sustain it all these years. And uh, this message that God has put on my heart, I realized after he gave me the scripture yesterday, um, it popped up in a conversation that I was having riding in the car yesterday. And um, But then when I, I thought about it later on and I meditated on it, I'm like, wait a second. I've been working on this sermon for the last 13 years, and I have a lot to talk about, about the importance of staying by the stuff. And that's exactly what we see in 1 Samuel chapter 30. We see that There were men who were part of the ministry of David. In fact, in this particular case, it was one third of David's mighty men. And they had gotten so tired in battle that they could not mount up and go out one more time to fight the Amalekites. But David said to these men, these 200 men, well, you stay here and stay by our stuff And we're going to go out and we're going to fight this battle. And as you'll see today, um, God gave David and his 600 mighty men. He gave them a fantastic victory. And when it came time to share the spoil, those backbiting (laughs) Laodicean Christians that were part of his 400 fighting men, they got mad. They were like the older brother in the prodigal son story. And they didn't want the older brother didn't want the prodigal son to be restored. He didn't want him to, to come back to the father's house. 
and these backbiting soldiers who had just helped David to win this battle, they were incensed, they were furious that David would allow them to share in the spoil. But then not only did David say to these men that they um, had earned a piece of the spoil because they stayed by the stuff, David saluted these men and he instituted an ordinance in Israel about this very same topic. So today, as we reflect on 13 years in ministry and looking forward to the future, a future that we all desperately hope includes the pre-tribulation rapture of the church sooner rather than later, um, I want us to, the theme today, if we're going to have a theme, (laughs) our theme today is gladness and gratitude uh, to our Heavenly Father, to our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has sealed us with His Spirit. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is um, uh, liberty. And the Bible says that Jesus is that Spirit. And So today we're going to be glad that he saved us today. We're going to be glad that he has um, uh, given us a job to do. And uh, we are going to break our alabaster box on the Lord Jesus Christ and say thank you. As she made her way to Jesus, she stumbles through the tears that made her blind. And she felt such pain, some spoke in anger, heard folks whisper, there's no place here for her kind. Bye. 
alabaster box. What an amazing gift of love from Mary of Bethany uh, on her Savior and on her friend, Jesus Christ. Um, while that song was playing, I just made a donation uh, to the Good Child Missions, and uh, that is the uh, ministry started by Erad Bursch in Uganda. And he's been trying to raise money um, to have a Christmas dinner for the kids that God has put into his care. And um, if God has enabled you to do so, why don't you pray about going to Good Child Missions? Uh, That website is goodchildmissions.com. And just go to the Donate button, and um, if you're able to, why don't you donate what you can um, so that Erad can put on that Christmas dinner uh, for those kids that he has been talking about and praying about. Um, uh, now the End Begins supports the Cup of Porridge program where we're feeding over 1,100 kids every Sunday for an entire year. And uh, we're very, very happy to do that. Um, so If God has put on your heart to want to help Erad with this Christmas dinner, um, I just donated, and if you're able to, um, just pray about it. Just go and pray about supporting Erad, and if you can't afford to donate, just pray that that day would be the success that God would want them to have, that God would want them to have. If you're just tuning in, you've reached the NTEB House Church Sunday service. We've been we've been doing this for over two years now, and uh, we are so glad and so grateful to the Lord for the increase that He's given us, and um, we're looking forward to getting more stuff done on the front lines of the end times. And this week we're going to be uh, well, we're going to have a little bit of a celebration here at Now the End Begins. And uh, one of the ways that we are going to celebrate is we are going to celebrate by by um, having a big sale, and that sale starts tomorrow, and that sale is going to go on from December 12th all the way to the end of the year, and you can just go to BibleBeliever.com, and you'll see, you'll see the sale, and uh, just click on the icon, that sale starts tomorrow, that sale starts tomorrow. And, um, uh, this is one sale that I am personally, this is, this is a very personal sale for me. It's not just a general sale for the bookstore, or it's not just something that's themed to, you know, like, like Cyber Monday or Blessed Friday sale. Um, this is, this is a sale, um, where the type of books that we're putting on sale are books that are extremely meaningful to me. Uh, that God has blessed to my understanding, that God has used to uh, increase my knowledge of the Bible, and and uh, just books that have really, really uh, been a blessing to me over the years. And so we encourage you, if you've been looking for some books uh, for your own library, or maybe you want to um, gift some of these books to somebody else, This uh, sale starts tomorrow, and it's going to go all the way to the end of the year, and I'm going to add stuff to it almost every single day until the year is over. Uh, We've never had a sale like this before, and we may never have one again, Um, but uh, there's going to be substantial savings on some amazing books. So check out that sale starting tomorrow. It's our end of the year anniversary sale. And uh, we hope and we pray that it will be a blessing for you. Touch their harp 
my greatest fears. You see, I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt. As His grace rolled down upon me, undeserved, for God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times. I wouldn't change them if I could, 'cause through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend. Trying to tell you everything he is, but the best way that I can say it is this: God's been good in my life. I feel so blessed. Beyond my wildest dreams, when I go to sleep each night, and though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. 'Cause through it all, God's been. You are good to us, and your word says that you daily load us with benefits. And again, Father God, we're just glad and we're grateful. We're glad that we can meet this morning and、uh, have church, and we give you all the honor and glory for it today. We pray for lost souls. We pray for、uh, Patrick to get saved, Sarah, Eric, Becky Jacobs, Greg and Melissa Price, Glenn Clark.、Um, Various family members in Jeanette's family, Trevor,、uh, members in Lori's family, members in my family, my three brothers. We pray for Jesse and his mom for salvation, for Rachel's dad Ralph, for unsaved Catholic family members in the Bolton family, for Colby Bohan, for Jordan Long and David Peck, members of the Weirs Bicky family, Kentucky Jeffrey. Uh, he has family members that need to get saved.、Uh, Jeanette and Bob from Wisconsin,、uh, unsaved family members. Connie's three kids. Joshua Gaskins praying for Stephanie and Michael and Uncle Steve.、Uh, Brandy praying for her family salvation. Rita in Colorado is praying for Dan.、Uh, two men named Ron. Spray of Sunshine is praying for、uh, her three sons. Shannon's praying for Lori W and Brian M. Rick Dotson, he needs to get saved. David Lacker,、uh, Barbara is praying for a bunch of people. Nicole Zimmer is praying for the Meads and the Cooks. Cheyenne is praying for、um, family members. Karen is praying for children and grandchildren.、Uh, Barbara is praying for her son Jody. Mark Sherlock, four-year-old Savannah and mom Stephanie. Verner Bukes is、uh, praying for Bob and Abby. Nancy is praying for Brandon and Michelle. Jill is praying for her husband Jerome and son and daughter. Kathy Hughes' son for salvation.、Uh, Zane up in Maine, who's a Jehovah's Witness who needs to get saved.、Uh, Lulu is praying for family members. Miles and his family need to get saved.、Um, A whole bunch of people in the Gia Camino family—they need to get saved. Don D 
Salvation prayers for David, Paul Caulfield, family members. Ramona Hayes is praying for Kimberly to be saved and delivered. Also, grandchildren, William, Jason, David, and Amanda. Patrick is praying for Jack and Aaron. Chelsea B. is praying for her ex-husband, his parents, his sister, and her husband. Adam is praying for wife Shana. Lori B. needs to get saved. Sharon McPherson um, has children that are not saved. Um, Lori Ann's grandfather, Irvin. Cheryl and Mark Fennell need to get saved. Kevin Thompson has a whole list of people that he wants to see saved. Steve Graves, Elga. Uh, we're praying for people in Ukraine that we sent Bibles to. Rob is praying for his three kids, Phyllis T for her husband. Uh, Summer Robbins praying for her dad. Todd Broom praying for brother Thad. Marie's friends, family, a whole bunch of people there. Adam and Katie, salvation prayers for um, parents, sisters, nieces, and nephews. Gary Tatterson, um, f- lots of family members need to get saved. Joe Rusiello, he's praying for family. Uh, Ellen is praying for her grandsons. His Grace is praying for uh, Rob and Summer, Sue and Mike, Carl, Jason, Rachel, Jason and Kerry. Lola's son, William, and his wife need to get saved. Hannah's mom needs to get saved. Bruce Bridges is praying for those exchange students. Anja, praying for Hanu, John, Charles, and Anna Lilsa. Dave Evidence is praying for his friend Taylor. Viviana is praying for her brother Javier Reyes. Scott Thaler needs to get saved. Adam and Katie praying for their neighbors. Loretta Oates praying for her sons. Jane is praying for her son, Troy. Julie Lynn is praying for Katie Ann. Chona is praying for various family members. Chuck Edgerton is praying for his son, Jacob, and mom, Lynette. Samantha uh, is praying for Beth. Deborah Hare is um, praying for unsaved family members. Rita, unsaved family members. Teresa, Lisa, Annabelle, Deborah Milton, Hap Nightingale all praying for unsaved family members. Trisha, co-workers, officers, Davis, Maury, Hancock, and Heath. Colonial man praying for Don Huff, Claire, and Virginia. Norman Merkel, he's praying for family members. Little Toe, praying for Trevin. Henrik Larson, praying for family members. Roz is praying for family members. Brian needs salvation prayer. Andrew Whittington needs to get saved. Marisol Barcina praying for her Catholic family in Panama. Rapture 57 is praying for unsaved family members. Gail is praying for Jim. Uh, Shirley Medor is praying for her brother and his wife. Eric Brian Huey is, is asking for salvation prayers for family members. Uh, we're praying for Tony the Carpenter and his son Cole. Kenny B. with unsaved family members, Rachel K., Sandra C., Marky Mark, Regina Danner, unsaved family members, Angela's mom, Rosemary, Carol from Georgia, unsaved family members, the Breda family for salvation, Uh, Stacy Bunton is praying for her husband's salvation, Rachel Adams is praying for uh, various people, Ashley is praying for, um, well, we are praying for Ashley to get saved. Um, Hard to Hurt would like salvation prayers for Dr. Warner and his family. Mark is praying for his sons and daughter. Mitch is praying for his daughters and their husbands. Uh, We're praying for our mailman at the bookstore. His name is Joey. He's having knee surgery and he needs to get saved. Regina is praying for Kelly, Chris, and Cisco. Jericho is praying for family members. Brenda's husband, Paul, needs to get saved. Ramona Hayes has family members uh, who are battling alcoholism, who are unsaved. Uh, Just remember the entire Hayes family in your prayers. Kevin Swift is battling a rare blood cancer. Harmon's son, Michael, uh, pancreatic cancer. Dawn Martin, best friend, stepbrother, Toby, with a brain aneurysm. Uh, Catherine B., 
Uh, she's chronically ill, and uh, we are praying uh, that God will give her strength. And uh, Pam has glaucoma. Katrina has breast cancer. Dave Evans is praying for her, his friend Diana with lymph node cancer. Uh, Chloe's dad has leukemia. Roz has asthma and scoliosis. Annetta needs a healing uh, from the Lord after a stroke. Natalie's hu- husband, Ken, has esophageal cancer. Roz has a daughter-in-law with cervical cancer. Bonnie is asking prayers for 17-year-old Ariel Roberts with a brain tumor. Clayton Perry has ongoing cancer treatments. Robert Wiley, ALS. Dina's mom, Marcy, uh, needs a healing from colon cancer. Chelsea B. is praying for six-year-old Camilla, who has a neuroblastoma. Kathy Kelly praying for her sister, Donia. Rob Beatty's colon cancer has come back. Dana Bragdon is having heart issues. We're praying that God would give her doctors much wisdom. Uh, Marriages, Stephanie and Andy, Angela and Jeff, Bianca and Derek, a night watch autist. Um, He says, please pray for my marriage as well. Erad is asking for prayers for Brother Morris and Sister Gift in Uganda. Um, Kathy Gia Camino is asking that various family members who are saved get on fire for God. Uh, Lori Cordes is praying for Kevin, who's in a wheelchair. Um, Various members of Chona's family, uh, we're lifting them up that God would give them a healing. Uh, Penny would like prayers for uh, the beginning stages of dementia. Feely would like prayers for her kids. Marie Shiroki's friend Jackie is in a wheelchair. Brooke Kettlecamp has ongoing special needs. Carrie is asking prayers for husband Jerry, possible dementia. Jackie Heyman would like prayers that she can regain custody of her son. Uh, Donna requests prayer for Amanda and Mark and baby Madison. James Pickett is in need of prayer. Um, he has long haul COVID and uh, he needs to get uh work. He needs to get a new job. He needs to get energy and motivation. And we pray that uh, God would bless him in all these areas. Please remember our overseas pastors. Um, In the Philippines, pastors John John Reed, Danny, and Arnell. Um, In Vietnam, Pastor Fojan. Luann is a American missionary ministering to the Muslims. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, Pastor David Mark in India of the Good News Baptist Church. Stephen McCarroll with a gospel bus ministry um, in Uganda. Irad Bairu Mumishu. Um, and we're praying that God would bless him with his ministry, Good Child Missions. Irad told me just yesterday um, that he's getting ready to start a house church. And um, we uh, pray that God would give him much uh, wisdom and guidance in that matter. Please remember our street preachers, Jeffrey in Ohio, Kyle and Reagan in Baton Rouge, up in Canada. We have Werner Bukes, uh, Adrian P. Breda, Greg Scott, Jeffrey Sapostinik. Um Joshua Gaskins in Virginia has a tract ministry. Um, uh, Paul and Peggy Caulfield up in Canada. Uh in South Africa, Arthur Uwes, um, Joe Rusiello, a street preaching ministry in Eagle Pass. Mike Abram is a trucker who leaves Bibles at truck stops. Mia is praying for Jay, who is a street preacher. And uh, Night Watch Autist and his friend Tom Fennessy would like us to pray for their street preaching ministry in Canada. Uh, and we're also remembering the family of John Henry. And uh, he he was with Now the End Begins from the very beginning. And we uh, pray much comfort on his family after his homegoing last week. Norman Merkel, he reached out this morning and said, I'm thinking about starting a broadcast um, that's going to combine news with the gospel. And uh, so please pray for Norman Merkel as he is uh, praying about stepping out in ministry. Uh, Little Toe is praying for Natalyn and Trayvon. Jill says prayer and praise. 
Thank you for prayers for my daughter's safe travel from Texas. She is here with me. Please pray for me, for God's Spirit to do a work in her heart. Uh, Pray with me for God's Spirit to do a work in her heart. Amen. Uh, Mia from Texas. We need prayers that my husband, Chris, um, he has a small business and he needs work. So please remember me as husband, Chris, in your prayers. Street Preacher Marie says, fighting physical, uh, uh, really tired. Sometimes I have to interpret these uh, messages that people send. Um, I think, though, that she's been really working really hard and she's been witnessing very much and she's tired And man, that really fits in with today's message of staying by the stuff. Um, Street preacher Marie is very faithful, and she's been staying by the stuff for years and years. And we lift her up in prayer today. Uh, Angel, prayer request under the weather, bad cough, no sleep. Shannon Krupp, please pray for souls that get tracks that hear the street preachers that see the billboards. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, Jill says, please add to my list, Carissa, Emmy, and Tori, my nieces for salvation. Spray of sunshine. Uh, My husband is losing job. Please pray for the Lord's will, mercy, and favor on a job that he is trying for. Amen. Jericho says, salvation prayers for three older brothers and their families, also for an unspoken. Uh, Berta Crab says, prayers still for Willie. Three toes on right foot are still bad, but no infection. Amen. Um, Peggy Caulfield, please pray for our doctor, Dr. DeGrosa, for salvation and for better health. Uh, Julia, please pray for my mother with a leaky heart valve. Annabelle. Please pray for my wife, Vilma, going to have knee surgery on Wednesday, that everything will be okay. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and the need is great, as it is every time we come before you. And you know all these things, Lord. And um, Father God, we just we just kneel before you in prayer today and ask you to work and move and and hear all these prayers, Lord. And sometimes I say that all the names and sometimes I just say the names of the family. But either way, God, you know, <laughs> you keep all of our prayers and all of our tears in a bottle. And uh, we know, Lord, that the prayers of your saints in every dispensation are a sweet odor unto you. And Lord, we do pray that our prayers are a sweet odor unto you and uh, wash us clean of anything that offends and remove anything that separates us from you. And uh, Lord, give us a fresh unction of your Holy Spirit today. And Lord, we we commit all these prayers to you. And uh, we ask you to work and move and restore and build. And uh, Father God, tear down what needs to be torn down and build up that which needs to be built up. And uh, let your word go forward in spirit and in truth. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, here we are on day one of year 14 of Now the End Begins. And I'm going to be preaching in just a couple of minutes today. I'm going to be preaching on... Uh, what happened to King David in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And actually, actually, the action starts back in chapter 27 of uh, 1 Samuel. And we're going to talk a little bit today about how God does things and how he works in people's lives. And we're going to talk about a biblical principle that I call um, staying by the stuff. And you're going to see today, if you're in ministry, and if you're saved, you're in ministry because you're called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Uh, Not everybody is called to go to Bible school. Not everybody is called to be a preacher, pastor, Sunday school teacher. Not everybody is called to be a missionary. Not everybody is called to hand out gospel tracts or go and preach on a street corner. But everybody, if you're saved, you are called to be a witness 
of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not optional. If you have been, uh, if you've heard the gospel, if you received it, believed it, and if you've accepted that payment that Jesus made on the cross as your payment, and if you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, um, of promise, and if you've been sealed unto the day of redemption, then you are called to be a witness of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today you're going to see why it's so important. You know, I forget who said this, but some famous person, and I think multiple people have said this, But 90% of success is showing up. 90% of success in this life is simply based on the fact that you show up and you want to get something done. Now, in the secular world, in the business world, if you show up for business, if you show up for work, there's a, an excellent chance by your active participation in whatever the process is that you are going to have success on some level because you are there and you showed up. And when you show up, you have an opportunity to participate and to get involved. And when you participate and get involved, you have an opportunity to get a victory in your chosen field of endeavor. So uh, I'm going to play a song before we get into the message, but let me just prime the pump a little bit today by telling you that the number one thing that you need to do if you want to get something done for the Lord, and you know, a lot of the times we read these biographies on Moody and Spurgeon and Peter Cartwright and William Tyndale and George Whitfield and Robert Sheffy and all the, and Billy Sunday and all these people that God has used to such a great degree, and we say, Lord, I'd like to do that. And God says, well, maybe I will let you do that, but how about you show up first, (laughs) right? So 90%, if you're going to serve the Lord in any capacity, 90% of your success is predicated on the fact that that you show up and you report for duty. Because if you don't show up, there is 100% of a chance that you're going to get nothing done because you're not part of the situation. So, um, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said that he was wrestling with the Lord for a long, long, long time. And he could not wrap his head around how to get saved. And he wrestled and he wrestled and he wrestled with God. And he could not figure out how to get saved. He couldn't wrap his mind around it. And then one day in the midst of a snowstorm, young Charles wandered into a congregational church where the regular pastor was out And a nameless, itinerant pastor had showed up to take his place. Spurgeon remembers very little about that message except for the verse that was the text for that nameless, itinerant preacher's message that day. And we find that text in Isaiah 45, verse 22. Isaiah 45, verse 22 says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. The first seven words of Isaiah 45, 22 are, look unto me, and be ye saved. Well, young Charles sat in the pew, and all of a sudden, it was as if a light bulb went off over his head. He had his light bulb moment. I don't know if the light bulb was invented at that time, but whether it was or whether it wasn't, um, Charles Spurgeon had a light bulb moment because he realized that even though that he could not figure out 
how to get saved with his brain. He couldn't wrap his head around what he needed to do to get saved that he was capable of looking. And he meditated on that text and he thought on that text and he said, what do I have to do to get saved? Well, if I may paraphrase, you have to show up. (laughs) You have to participate. You have to say, um, like we read about in Isaiah chapter six, when God says to Isaiah and whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, here am I, Lord, send me, send me, Lord. Charles Spurgeon got saved because he realized that all he had to do was show up. He had to show up at the foot of the cross. He had to show up and say, here am I, Lord, save me. Here am I, Lord, send me. That's all he had to do. Salvation is so easy and salvation is so simple. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Serving the Lord is simple too. I didn't say it was easy. (laughs) I said it was simple. All you have to do if you're saved, you have to show up and then you have to stick by the stuff. When we get back, I'm going to bring you a message on the importance of staying by the stuff. So glad that you are here today. Abraham prayed for the day. God would give him a son. Blessed Isaac was his name, the greatest gift he'd ever known. Then came the day who would have dreamed. God would say, you got to give him back to me. And on this mountain, you must prove that it's you and Isaac, or it's me and you.
surrender all to Him. I freely give. I, I will ever, I'll love and I'll trust Him in His presence. Day. Heavenly Father, be with me as I preach and teach this morning. Take me out of the way and speak through me, Father God, and we'll give you all the honor and the glory for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, we got a lot to talk about this morning, and uh, my message, my text for today is found in 1 Samuel chapter 30, if you're just tuning in. First, cham- first, <laughs> first Samuel, chapter thirty, uh, verse twenty-four. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as is his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. So the first thing I want to show you about my text today is that David, who is a type of Jesus Christ, King David is saying, uh, well, who's going to listen to you? Because I say that the person who went to the battle and physically fought is going to be an equal recipient with the people who stayed behind and stayed by the stuff. King David said, they shall part alike, meaning they shall partake alike. They shall partake equally. And verse 25 says, and it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Now, Go back to chapter 27 of 1 Samuel, and today's message is going to be part Bible study and part sermon, and I want to show you some amazing things that take place in chapters 27, 28, 29, and leading into our text in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let's take a look at um, the first seven verses of 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1 says, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. Uh, If you've ever read the history of King Saul and David, then you know that uh, King Saul was jealous of David, he was afraid of David, and he knew that God's favor was with David and not so much with himself. So Saul tried to kill King David. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 27, David is, he's getting discouraged And he decides that he's going to go and temporarily defect 
from the nation of Israel, and he's going to go into the land of the Philistines because he wants to escape from the hand of Saul. Verse 2 says, And David arose, and he passed over with the six hundred men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Moak, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, that I may dwell there, for why shouldn't thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day, and the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. So, chapter 27 shows you something amazing. It shows you David, and he is temporarily defecting to the side of the enemy, and he's kind of forced to do it because King Saul is intent on killing him. So he really doesn't have any other option. Now, we are going to see that um, even though, now you might say to me, well, did David do the right thing or the wrong thing by defecting to the enemy? Well, David did what he had to do to preserve his life. And you're going to see that during this process, King Saul goes and inquires of the witch at Endor, and he tries to get wisdom from the deceased prophet Samuel. But David, he inquires of the Lord. And if you've ever read these chapters, you know how it works out. Um, King David winds up getting killed in battle. Uh, because in First Samuel chapter 28, um, he goes after banning people who communicate with f- a familiar spirit. Uh, King Saul puts on a disguise and he goes to the witch at Endor and he communicates with the familiar spirit and he winds up losing the battle. Um, King David, he didn't do that. He went to the Lord God. Now, uh, let's pick up the action in 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I really don't want to spend much time on 27, 28, and 29, because that's a whole separate message, and I don't really want to focus on the battle today. I want to focus on the aftermath of the battle, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of context for what we are about to read in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So let's start reading in verse 1. Now, you understand that David temporarily for a 16-month period, he defected and he went with the Philistines and he went to the nation of Gath and he forms a alliance with Achish. And Achish knows that David is a very valiant man, very strong man. He is very good in battle and he has a huge army with him. So Achish gave him the city of Ziklag. Now, what happens, starting in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, this is where things get really difficult. 1 Samuel 30, verse 1, And it came to pass, when David and his men, he has 600 men, were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city of Ziklag, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive." Now, look at what happens in 1 Samuel 30, verse 4. 
Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. What are they crying about? They are crying and weeping over the fact that the Amalekites came into Ziklag. They burned the entire place to the ground. They stole their possessions. They kidnapped their wives and their children, and they were holding them captive. David, um, the Bible says that David and the 600 men that were with him, they lifted up their voice and they wept until they had no more power to weep. Uh, verse 5 says, And David's two sons were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I want you to underline that, First Samuel 30, verse 6. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So the first thing that I want to show you about fighting the battle that we are in, the end times battle of the front lines, and we talk about this all the time. We say the war is real, the battle is hot, and the time is short to the fight. And um, we talk like that because the Bible talks like that. Uh, Second, Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul says that we are called to be soldiers. And what are soldiers called to do? They are called to fight. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And you cross-reference that with Revelation 19.14. Go look it up. Um, and then verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So, back in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, the fearless David, he's weeping, he's grieving, and now the people are starting to murmur against him, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. When the battle gets tough, you got to throw yourself at the feet of the Lord. Uh, the Bible says that you, that you need to humble yourself that in due time you may be exalted by the mighty hand of God. Um, that, that is a, a New Testament biblical principle. Um, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And David, when he realized that he was losing this battle, when David realized that the Amalekites had burned down his entire city, that Achish had given him, when David heard the cries of the people who were murmuring against him, what did he do? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And then he takes a action step. 1 Samuel 30, verse 7. After encouraging himself in the Lord his God, David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. Now the ephod was something that was very valid in the Old Testament with the Jewish people. And this is what they used for God to communicate with them. David didn't have the revelation of the entire Bible. David didn't have all these things in front of him that we have. So he had the ephod, and uh, that's what David was going to consult so that he could hear from the Lord. Now, in our day, we don't have an ephod. We don't need an ephod. All we have is the living, breathing Word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, in Hebrews 4.12, the Bible talking about itself, 
for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, King David went into battle with a physical sword. You and I go into battle with the sword of the Lord, um, which is the word of God. And in verse 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 30, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Verse 9 of 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30 says, So David went, he and his six hundred men that were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those that were left be that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and his four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind. Now, why were these two hundred men of the six hundred men? Why did they not follow the other 400 men and David into battle? It says in 1 Samuel 30, verse 10, uh, For 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Now, these men are not cowards. They are not scared. They are not afraid. They're exhausted. <laughs> They're tired. Their nerves are frazzled. They really can't continue. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt so worn out, so tired, so unbelievably depleted of resources that you just say to the Lord, I can't go forward anymore? Remember back uh, when the prophet Elijah and he had that great victory over the 450 prophets of Baal. And he beats them all in spectacular fashion. And then what happens? Uh, is there a great revival in the land? No. Now he has to deal with that wicked woman Jezebel who sends him a letter saying that she will surely seek his life. Now, Elijah wasn't afraid of Jezebel or her uh, pusillanimous husband, King Ahab, David, uh, not David, Elijah, Elijah was exhausted. He said, I can't really face this situation after going through this tremendous victory. Now I have to deal with this woman Jezebel and God takes the prophet Elijah and he takes him down by the brook Kidron and he feeds them. He feeds him from the mouth of a bird and he gives him rest. The Bible says that the Lord giveth his beloved sleep and he allows Elijah to recharge himself. And when he had recharged himself, he gets him up and sends him back into the battle. So here in first Samuel chapter 30, it's at verse 10, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and they did eat and he did eat and they made him drink water. So David leaves the 200 men right on the edge of the brook Besor and he takes the 400 men and he starts to travel to see if they can find where the Amalekites have taken their possessions and taken their women and children. And in the process of looking for the Amalekites, he finds an Egyptian. And David says in uh, verse 13, And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he says that he is a young man, he is a servant to an Amalekite, and he had gotten sick, and he, and, and he was left behind. And um, David says to him in verse 15, and David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? 
Now the Egyptian's a little nervous, and he says, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And look at what happens in verse 16. And when he had brought them down, behold, they were spread abroad all the earth, upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. Remember when David went to the ephod and said, he inquired of the Lord, should I pursue these people? If I, if I go after the Amalekites, will you give me the victory? And God told David, yes, I will give you the victory. Go get them. And verse 17 says, And David smote them from the twilight even on to the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David had rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And verse 20 says, And David took all the flocks and the herds which they had drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. Now, I'm almost getting ready to give you the meat of my message today. This is really all. I'm just setting the table. My message is not going to be long today. But I want to show you this amazing biblical principle that if you're going to serve the Lord on any level, in any capacity, you have to understand this biblical principle. It's a very simple one, but it can be hard to do. And I'll explain why in just a minute. First um, Samuel thirty twenty says uh, that David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the, the uh, people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. David is coming back as the conquering hero. This is all part of the legend of what would become Israel's greatest king, King David. And David comes back in absolute triumph. But there's two things that I want you to pay attention to. The number one thing is David is coming back in absolute triumph because David inquired of the Lord. He went to the Lord his God and said, you tell me what to do. You, If you give me the blessing, I'll go ahead and I'll do it, but I only want to do it if you're going to give me the victory. That was step number one. Step number two, David realized that his 200 men that were so faint were still very valuable to him and not just valuable to him, that they were valuable to the Lord. And so David gives them a job that's not fighting in the battle. But David tells them, you guys rest here by the brook. And we're going to leave all the stuff with you that we don't need to fight this battle. We're going to dump it all here by the brook. All you guys have to do is just watch our stuff till we get back. And in 1 Samuel 30, verse 21, it says, And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. He is thanking. He is thanking the 200 men who were so faint that they had to stay behind with the stuff. Immediately, immediately in verse 22, and God calls these people wicked men. He calls them men of Belial. And who is he talking about? He's talking about certain members of the 400 men that David just won the battle with. 1 Samuel 30, verse 22. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, because they, 
went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. So these nasty, I'll call them Laodicean Christians, um, these nasty, backbiting ingrates, you would think that they just followed David into battle and God gave them this amazing victory. And now these wicked men say, well, these guys who stayed behind, they shouldn't get to share. They can get their family back. They can get their wives back. But um, they, they don't have the right to participate in the sharing of this spoil that we got by beating the Amalekites. And look at what David says in verse 23. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who has preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. You see what David is telling them? David is reminding these wicked men of Belial that the only reason why they have the spoil, the only reason why they got their wives and their kids back, the only reason why they got the victory over the Amalekites is because David inquired at the Lord and David says, the Lord hath given us the victory. He has preserved us in the battle and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. And verse 24, now we have gone full circle. We are back where we started. David says in verse 24 of 1 Samuel 30, For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as, is, but as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, they shall part alike. You know, King David is much like God. He is much like Jesus Christ. He is a type of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, Luke chapter 1, verse 32, talking about Jesus Christ, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. You see how David... Now, you can point to Uriah the Hittite. You can point to Bathsheba all you want. And that's there and that's fair and that's fine. But David was a man after God's own heart. And the Bible says, and the Lord God shall give unto Jesus Christ the throne of his father, David. So back in first, first Samuel chapter 30, David is telling the wicked men of Belial that these men who were so faint that all that they could do was stay by the stuff. That was a very valuable service that they performed that day. And that gave David and the 400 men the freedom to go and fight the battle. And it's interesting that David had 600 men and one third of those men were not able to go in, but they shared in the spoil. Now, the Bible says in the book of Zechariah, it says that one third um, God shall bring through the fire. And these 200 men that were so faint that all they could do was stay by the stuff, David had praise for these men. David shared the spoil of the war with them that day. And that is a beautiful tight picture of the judgment seat of Christ. When you and I are going to share not just in the labors that the Lord used us, but the ways that God used us to help up and hold up the the hands of other people who were fighting the battle. And that's what the judgment seat of Christ is going to reveal for you and I. So I just want to talk to you. That was the setup. And 
Uh, I have a short message today. It's not going to go on long. But I want to talk to you today about the importance of sticking by the stuff and staying by the stuff. Um, over the years, I said at the start of this broadcast that today is day one of year number 14 of the ministry of Now the End Begins. And let me tell you something. The landscape that I saw 13 years ago is a completely different landscape that I look at in 2022. The world has changed. Governments have changed. The new world order um, has established itself and is uh, encroaching on a daily basis. Tomorrow, our podcast is going to be Welcome to Day 1001 of 15 Days to Flatten the Curve. And we are going to talk about some absolutely astounding things that have taken place over the last 1,001 days of 15 days to flatten the curve. But what I'm talking about is not the external things. Back when I started Now the End Begins 13 years ago, there was a whole lot of people who were on the battlefield who were not on the battlefield today. And there are various reasons why these people are no longer on the bat on the battlefield for the Lord Jesus Christ. But suffice to say, there is an empty chair where they used to be. The Bible talks about staying by the stuff. It seems like a small job. But God says that he who has called you is faithful and he will do it. Um, The Bible says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it even unto the day of Jesus Christ. And you have to remember that if you're going to be on the battlefield for the Lord, you have got to resolve in your mind that you're going to stay by the stuff. I can remember back in the year 2013. And uh, now the end begins had been growing and getting a wider audience. And uh, I was learning how to do that ministry better. And I had recently started an online Bible broadcast back in 2012. And it, everything was growing and God was blessing and people were getting saved. And how well I remember the day that when I was working at Citibank, And my out-of-the-closet lesbian manager went to my website, saw Now the End Begins, and she fired me the very next day. And the people at the recruiting company that had placed me there, they were baffled. Uh, This woman had broken every single rule that Citibank had agreed to. I probably could have had a um, religious discrimination lawsuit. But when I prayed about it, the Lord just told me to take it. So I took it and I lost my job at Citibank because of the ministry of now the end begins. So I thought to myself, well, no problem. I have a great resume. I'm highly qualified. It should be very easy for me to get another job. And it was. Within two weeks, I was working over at Florida Blue, also a multi-billion dollar company, and um, I had gotten exactly the same salary that I had at Citibank, and I, I met with those people. They hired me on the spot, and I reported to work the first day. Everything was great. The second day, they gave me a computer, and they set me up. But by the middle of the week, I had sensed, and perhaps it was my imagination, I had sensed that uh, there was a little bit of a, of a coolness in how they were dealing with me. Uh, the next day, Thursday, that coolness had turned into a coldness. And then by Friday, I noticed that almost nobody was talking to me. I thought maybe it was my imagination. I thought people were having a bad week. And I honestly didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Well, that Sunday, I am in the middle of 
a Bible study. Remember, we had only started the Bible studies about a year earlier. So I was still learning how to do that. I was still, you know, uh, uh, knee deep in that whole process. And all of a sudden, my cell phone starts ringing. Now, I ignored the cell phone, but every time that I hung up the call, the person called back. And then they sent me a text message and said, this is your recruiter. Call me right away. And so I forget what I said exactly. I said I had to take a short break and I played a couple of songs and I stopped the Bible broadcast and I called my recruiter and I said, what's the emergency? And they basically told me, they basically told me that if I showed up for work the next day, that the police were standing by to arrest me. And I asked him, arrest me for what? And he said that they didn't want to say, but that I had violated something and I was not welcome back on the property. Now, I found out later is that the, the, um, the manager from Citibank had found that I had gotten a job at Florida Blue, and then she went and she blackballed me and got me fired from, uh, from this new job. And then, by this point, I was blackballed with the recruiters, and nobody would hire me for anything. Within a couple of months, I began to run out of money, and um, I found myself unable to pay my rent. So, and I've shared this story with you before. I'm not going to go deeply into it, but suffice to say that for the first time in my adult life, I was unable to provide a dwelling place for myself. I had to put my stuff in storage. And I had to find a place to live uh, because I now found myself to be homeless. And this, I believe it was the summer either of, yeah, I think it was the summer of 2014. And the entire spring, the entire summer going up into fall, I was homeless and completely at the mercy of other people. I had lost all my money. My possessions were in storage. And I can remember, I can remember the very first night that I went to this hotel and I realized, well, I can't keep going to hotels because I don't have that much money. And I cried and I cried and I cried just like King David in 1 Samuel chapter 30, where it says, um, uh, that they wept until they could weep no more. First Samuel 30, verse 4, And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. So I want you to imagine you in this situation. Here I am serving the Lord, trying to get something done, out on the battlefield, and I take a direct hit from the enemy. And then two weeks later, I take another direct hit. And then in a matter of time, all my money is gone. Now, a friend of mine took me in and gave me a place to stay. So in my mind, I thought, okay, I'm going to take a little time off. I'm going to relax. I'm going to regroup and I'll see about getting a new job. And when I prayed about it, God said to me, while you're relaxing and while you're regrouping, make sure that you're still doing the Sunday night Bible study. And I said to him, Lord, where would you like me to do that? I don't, I don't have that location anymore. I would have to do it on my phone. I mean, that would be, I don't know. I don't want to do that. <laughs> And uh, I prayed about it, and God said, look, I called you to this ministry. Now, are you going to do it or not do it? And so to my astonishment, to my absolute amazement, 
in the middle of this unbelievably confusing time, God says, you, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to serve me, you have to stay by the stuff. And either you're going to do it or not do it. Now, are you in or are you out? So it was at that moment and it was during that time period that my understanding of what real ministry is all about became firmly fixed in my mind. And when you read these verses in 1 Samuel chapter 30 about the men who were so tired and so faint that all they could do was stick by the stuff, that's what you're called to do as a Christian. So if you're tired today and we're all tired, if you're worn out, if you're discouraged, if you're thinking, how is it possible that I can even go on today? Remember what David did. When David was wondering, should he pursue the Amalekites? He didn't do like King Saul and go inquire of a familiar spirit. The Bible says that David inquired of the Lord and David built himself up in the Lord, his God. And David had a tremendous battle in front of him. And this biblical principle You may be too tired to fight, but there is no retirement. There is no quitting. There is no stopping because this battle that you and I are in is a daily battle. It is not predicated on, you know, lockdowns or no lockdowns. If we're locked down, it's a battle. If they let us out, then we're free. That's not the fight that we're fighting. You and I are fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what you and I are fighting against. And that battle is every minute of every day. So you have to decide in your own mind and in your own heart, are you in or are you out? And you may be so faint that you can't continue in the battle. God says, that's fine. You can rest here by the brook, but you have to stay by the stuff. There's no walking away. This is what you signed on for. Remember the day when the gospel was preached and the Holy Spirit convicted you and you got saved? Remember what a glorious day that that was? Well, that was the day that Jesus Christ purchased you and you became his possession. And Jesus Christ stayed by the stuff when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and his soul was so pressed that blood and sweat came out as uh, across his forehead. And he went to the cross and said, I thirst. Jesus Christ stayed by the stuff all the way to the end and all the way. And when he came back up on the third day, he came up with that great victory like David came up with that great victory. And all the disciples, they were all astonished and they were all worn out and they didn't know what to believe and they were all confused. And Jesus Christ He met them on the coast and he broiled some fish and had a honeycomb and he was tender and comforting to them. You got to stay by the stuff. That's what we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And if you are a soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ on the end times battlefield, there is no quit. There is no stopping. There is no checking out and checking back in. The Bible says that a a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And you need to decide today, are you in or are you out? And if you're too tired to fight the battle, then you can absolutely rest for a season by the river. But you got to stay by that stuff and not let it go. 
And when David came back with the spoils of that battle, he rewarded those men equally, even though they did not do necessarily an equal job. But God is showing us the importance of not quitting. You can, you, you can rest, but you can't quit. You can't stop. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for these 13 years of ministry. I thank you for day one of year 14. And Lord, uh, there have been many times over the last 13 years where I have been tempted to quit, where I have gotten frustrated, where, where I have felt the slings and arrows of betrayal, where people have attacked. And uh, Father God, there have been many times where I thought to myself that this is more trouble than it's worth. But you showed me time and again the importance of staying by the stuff and not quitting because, Father God, I'm not in this battle for um, the applause and the acclaim of men. I'm not in this battle to become famous. I am in this battle to get something done for you in these last days before you call us home on flight 777. And Father God, uh, for every one of us today that is tired, every one of us that is weary, for every one of us that is thinking of getting out, Lord, I pray that you give us an extra dose of your spirit today to help us to stay by the stuff until we can get back in the battle and we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, just a simple message. It was really more of a Bible study than it was of a message, but it's so important that we don't quit. It is so important that we stay by the stuff and You know, so many people want to do great things for God. And one of the greatest things for God that you can do is not quit. And if you do that, if you do that, God will get you through that time. God will sustain you. God will see you through to the other side. And then is coming that day where God is going to give the victory. And when that day happens and we see that um, in type, David is bringing the spoil back to the people and they are rejoicing and they are celebrating. And those men that stayed by the stuff, they get to participate equally. Why? Because they stayed by the stuff. It's not hard. It's not, it's, It's simple. Don't quit and stay by the stuff until victory comes. I thank you so much for being part of the NTEB global family of Bible believers across America and around the world. And uh, I thank you for supporting this ministry and for praying for this ministry. Uh, We are only able to do these things that we do because you support us and you pray for us. And I thank from the bottom of my heart, I thank each and every one of you. Let's stay by the stuff. Let's get something done. And uh, we're getting out of here sooner than you realize. Join us tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, for another uh, NTEB Rightly Dividing King James Bible Study. Have a great afternoon, everybody.
in my life. 